Recently, I read a book that was fascinating. It was entitled The Culture Map. Some of you may have read it. I would encourage anyone who works in a multicultural environment to read that book or one like it. It looks at cultures and grades them on eight different scales and puts the countries in a rating. It looks at things like communication, trust, persuasion, and time, and rates how cultures fare. For example, in your culture, do you build trust by doing tasks together? Or do you build trust by sharing social time together? It's important to know if you're doing business. When it comes to persuasion, are you a principle first culture or an application first culture? A principle first culture is one that looks at building up the argument slowly and carefully before presenting the conclusion. An application first society looks at just presenting the conclusion primarily and then some bullet points to back it up. The United States is a application first culture, whereas France, Germany, Spain and Brazil, for example, would be more principle based. Is your culture linear time or flexible time? Interestingly, each culture views the other one as being inefficient. When it comes to communication, some cultures are direct and some are indirect. Direct and indirect. It'll probably come as no surprise to you that the United States is the most direct communication culture in the world, partly due to its history. It doesn't have much of a history. It's only two, three hundred years old. So there's not much history to get a shared context together. And also because it's a land full of immigrants. People have come there from all over the world. They don't speak English as their first language. So they've had to learn to be direct to get their point across. Americans have no problem telling you exactly what they think and how they think something should be done. They are forthright and to the point people. Coming here from England, uh, we, we see things a little bit differently. Maybe we're a, lot, a little bit more indirect than Americans. We would often view Americans as being crashed and bold and, and maybe a little bit too forthright. They have no problem telling you how good they are at something. We would often take things a little bit more easy. It, it, it's better for us to, 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 to underplay ourselves and surprise you at the end than, than be too boastful and then look a little bit embarrassed later on. I remember recently I was going snowboarding in America with some friends and as we were driving in the car to the destination, uh, they were all talking for about 45 minutes about what they could do with a snowboard and how, how, how they could snowboard. And I, I, I was listening to them and I, I, I've snowboarded a little bit myself, maybe for the past 15 years, and I'm, I consider myself fairly proficient with the snowboard at my feet. But as I was listening to these guys, I, I texted my wife and I said, I, I seem to be sitting in a car full of snowboarding professionals. She laughed. She understood the context. I, I remember what a former chair of the communication department, Andrews, told me once, and she said that when she's interviewing Americans, she always assumes that they can do less than what they say. Now, American culture being direct, in some ways, the way we've read the Bible, one could argue, is influenced that way, with our church being largely US centric. Some of the texts in the Bible that we, we focus on a lot are texts that deal with people who are bold, people who are assertive, people who are strong, people who stand. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard a sermon based on Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. He determined. I've preached it or referenced it at least in sermons many, many, many times. And we focus on how Daniel was proud. Sorry, not the proud. How Daniel was strong, how he was bold and how he was courageous. And we stood for right, though the heavens fall. We look at the book of Esther. And in Esther, we, we often focus on just one verse. Esther chapter 4. And that verse where it says, I'll go into the king. And if I perish, I perish. And we focus on that Esther was bold. Esther stood and Esther went to the king. And, and even though really, when you look at the whole story of Esther, and you look at all the things that happen in her life, we often, you could argue, interpret that text to suit our own ends, as opposed to what it really, who Esther was in the context of the whole book. But we come to the conclusion, Esther was bold, end of story, and we, we kind of leave it there. 
David standing before Goliath. And when David stood before Goliath, you know, he says, I am, the, I am a servant of the living God. And he went forward and killed Goliath. And, and we like those passages of scripture because they, 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 they're the scriptures that talk about being bold and being strong, forthright. Now this bold and assertive approach filters down to the way we share our faith and often the way we view ourselves. We are taught, and rightly so, that we should know what we believe. We are taught, and rightly so, that we should know why we keep the Sabbath. We should know at least five or six texts that we can go to in the Bible that, that guide us as to why we go to church on the Sabbath day. We should know why the dead are in the grave and they're not in heaven. We should be able to articulate the reasons for our faith, rightly so. We are, we, we are taught what is the three angels' message and, and how we can understand that. And this, this week we're kind of focusing somewhat on the three angels' message from different angles. What are those three angels' message and how do they impact our faith? We are being taught all of these things. We see them contained in the pages of Scripture. Now, oftentimes, the way that we look at Scripture and the way that we share it, you could argue, is a statement of I am. We're taught to be confident in who we are, and we should be confident in who we are. I am a Christian, and I'm proud to say it. I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm proud to say it. These are statements of I am. These are statements of I am. We are taught to be able to state and articulate what we believe. It is important for us to know and understand what does it mean to give glory to God? What does it mean for the hour of his judgment has come? What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and all springs of waters? To know who is Babylon and why we should call people out of it. To know what the mark of the beast is and why we're warning people against it. These are all aspects and components of the three angels message. And it's important, it's incredibly important for us to understand these so that we have confidence in our identity. We have confidence in who we are. But you could argue and you could say that uh, as powerful as Daniel chapter 1 is where it says he purposed in his heart, as powerful as that chapter is, Daniel chapter 6, you could argue, is just as powerful. In Daniel chapter 6, there's been a power transfer, there's been a change as to who is in charge. And there we have the Medo-Persia Empire, whereas previously in chapter 5, it is the Babylonian Empire. Just imagine, if you will, those of you who... The majority of you based in America, those of you there, imagine, if you will, that when Joe Biden takes over as the, well, took over as the president of the United States, he asked Mike Pence to serve as his second in command. Imagine when Donald Trump became president in 2016, if he asked Hillary Clinton to be his secretary of state because she had previously been a secretary of state. These thoughts are unfathomable. They just would not happen that someone from one party would ask someone from the other party to be their second in command. But when the Medo-Persian Empire took over Babylon, the king of Medo-Persia asked Daniel, who was a slave of the previous, no, it wasn't really a slave, but he was a captured um, person from the previous empire. He obviously was living as a free man, but you know, you could use the phrase, he was the slave, slave, to run the empire. It just wouldn't happen. But Daniel is given that position based on who he was and based on his character. And, they, and, and when I read Daniel chapter six, I realized that when that chapter was written, K King Darius probably only knew Daniel for months. Definitely not years. At the most, it might've been a year. He's only known him for a very, very short period of time. He hasn't known him for a long period of time. And there's a story, as you know, that uh, in, in Daniel chapter 6, where they can't worship anyone except the king for 30 days. Daniel opens his windows. He worships before God so everyone can see him. He's called before the king. You know the story. And Daniel is thrust into the lion's den. But it's the words in Daniel chapter 6. If you have a Bible, it's the words in Daniel chapter 6 that are probably some of the most powerful words in the whole book of Daniel. For there in Daniel chapter 6, and I believe it's verse 16, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, After they cast him into the lines, then it says, The king came and said to Daniel, Your God, who you serve continually, he will deliver you. 
Here the king, who has only known Daniel for a short period of time, maybe weeks, months, unlikely years, but a short amount of time, he's only known Daniel, and he already says, your God, who you serve continually, he will deliver you. Your God that you serve continually. Here it's not Daniel stating, I serve God all the time, but it's someone else making a statement about him. Your God, who you serve continually, he will deliver you. We know the story how it ends. Daniel comes out the lion's den and, 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 and he is not hurt by what has taken place. The testimony came from someone else, not from Daniel. And the title of this message is, You Are Is Better Than I Am. You Are Is More Powerful Than I Am. While it's good and while it's important that we know our I Am statements, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, I am a Christian, I believe in the Three Angels message, I keep the Sabbath, and this is the reason why. While it's important we understand the I Am parts of our faith, I'm arguing today and I'm making the point that while we believe the Three Angels message, while we say we are the remnant church, it's more powerful when other people look at us and say, you are, you are, you are. You may say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. You may say you love God. But it's far more powerful when someone else says that about you. Whilst we don't live for the opinions of other people, that is true. Whilst we should know who we are and our opinion of ourselves is not based on what other people think, it does hold some influence at times. I remember when I was in college back several years ago and, and a new student came to the college and as he came to the college and you sit there in the cafeteria and, and you start to ask questions about each other, what they've done and where they are and what talents and gifts they have in life. And one of my friends asked him and he said, he said, do you sing and do you play an instrument? And he said, yeah, yeah, I sing. And then, and so he said, oh, you should come to the choir practice. And he said, do you play an instrument? And, and his answer was, I can tickle the ivories. I can tickle the ivories. Now, when someone tells you they can tickle the ivories, you kind of assume, well, if they're saying it like that, you assume that they can play the piano, the ivories on, on the keys of the piano. And so the, the day or two later, they went to the choir practice and the pianist that day was not there, the normal pianist. And so as the choir director got there, they noticed that the pianist wasn't there for some reason. They were unable to attend. And so the, the, the friend who'd been there longer, he, he says, hey, hey, <laughs> to the choir director, hey, so-and-so, He's able to play. And so she looked at the new, the, the, new, the new person who was coming there for practice. She said, oh, could you go play for us? So he stands up and he walks over there to the piano. And he, and he adjusts the, um, the, the, the music there. And then he sits down. And then looking back at the choir director as she started to kind of, you know, move her hand, he then took one finger and he took another finger and went, dang, dang, dang. And then looks back at the choir director with no smile, no joking, no nothing, serious face, just looks back and says, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit rusty today. Then he stands up and goes and walks back uh, to sit there and sing with everyone else. Now, he may say, I can tickle the ivories. He may say, I can play the piano. But I can assure you, after that moment, no one, no one ever said about him again, oh, that guy can play the piano. None of us. I mean, we all ribbed him mercilessly and still continue to, it's a running joke amongst our circle of friends about how on earth could you ever get up in front of the choir and, and pretend to play the piano when all you can use is two fingers and do that with no shame. None of us ever testify he can play the piano. As far as, we can, as far as we're concerned, he can't play the piano, no matter what he says about himself. You know, when we were filming for Lineage, some of you may have seen the Lineage videos that we've filmed in different parts of Europe and around, um, you know, America and Australia and different parts of the world. We've had the privilege to travel to some beautiful places. And as we travel and, and film, you know, the, the long days filming, we, we're sometimes out from early morning until late night filming, have breakfast before we go. Sometimes we're filming all day and we don't get to eat until the end. Now, when we're out there filming, one of the uh, members on the team, his name is Clive Kute, he, in fact, it was his, his idea as to, to come up with Lineage. He's the media director at Wima, and he currently is the, you know, the head of media for Lineage. Now, about myself, if you were to ask me, am I a vegetarian? I'd say, yes, I'm a vegetarian. And everyone who's known me would say, Adam is a vegetarian. 
My whole life I've been vegetarian. I've never eaten meat. People would know me, no, I'm vegetarian. But if you were to say, Adam, are you vegan? I'd say, well, in all honesty, I try uh, most of the time, but I would never say I am just because I'm not all the way. But Clive Kute will tell you I'm a vegan. Tell you I'm a vegan. When we're filming for Lineage, no matter where we are, in the middle of the Waldensian Valleys, in some small little village in England, in Cairo, or in New Zealand, I know at the end of the day, when I'm with Clive, I've got to find a restaurant or a food place to eat that will have suitable vegan food. I'll never be able to go to Clive and say, hey Clive, I'm sorry, there's only one place in this town and there's, there's only one um, takeaway, there's only one restaurant here, so we're just, gonna have to, we're just gonna have to get a pizza today. That's our only option. Clive would never respond and be like, oh, okay, mm -mm. When Clive says I'm a vegan, I will always testify, Clive is a proper vegan, meaning he never bends, he, he, he never like fudges the line, no matter where we are, and no matter how hungry it is, it does not matter. Clive will say, I'm vegan, that's it, line drawn. I just won't eat. If that's the only thing on offer, I just won't eat. He says he's a vegan. He will say he's a vegan. But everyone on our team, and everyone who knows anything about him, even when he's not there, would also say the same thing. You are, you are, you are is more powerful than just I am on its own. When the you are is accompanied with I am, there's a strength and a power there. When even our enemies would testify that of us. When you read the stories of the Reformation, when people, as they were being martyred, people kind of mm, don't like the person. But I can see that they're kind and they're a Christian. You know, I used to work for Amazing Facts. I worked for them for three years, um, back about 13 years ago. I traveled around the United States as an evangelist. And so I went to about six or, or seven different churches each year. Now, when I would always get to these churches, the same description of their church was offered. I get to the church and they tell me about their church and the community, but almost invariably without fail, each of the churches would say, we're a friendly church. We're a friendly church. And I'd be like, oh, that's an interesting one. Self-proclaiming that you're friendly? Interesting. You say you're friendly. What does the community say? It's up to them to decide if you're friendly, not for you to say, I'm friendly. We all seem friendly to each other, but when an outsider comes in, are we really a friendly church? To be a self-professed friendly church or friendly workplace or, or friendly environment doesn't really mean anything. That's kind of like saying that I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that I'm humble. You can't say that I, you know, we are a friendly place. When I think about our churches across America and around the world, and if I think, you know, so many of our churches name themselves the community church. This is a community church. This is a church for the community. The community never said it was a place for the community. We just say, this is a community church. If our communities labeled our churches or filled in the sign that sits outside our churches, what would they call us? Would they call us friendly? Would they call us loving? Would they call us kind? Would they call us someone who cares? What would they say about us? What would they say? To be kind and friendly doesn't depend on who we're talking to. It should come from within. It should be something that's genuine. A friendly church truly is a friendly church. It doesn't matter who they're talking to. It doesn't matter who they're talking to. One of the favorite churches in England that I visit, I really appreciate going to preach and, and, and eat at this church because they, they, they have this homeless ministry and, 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 and they, they make a point that when they have the homeless ministry, they always give the, 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 the people who come there, they give them you know, the, the best silverware, the best 
plates. They lay the table out as if, you know, the conference president was coming to the church. And they do that for the homeless people every week, every single week. They say, we treat these people like they're one of our own. That's how we treat them. I remember when I was recently married, I got married seven years ago, when I was newly married and traveling around England and preaching in different churches. And as I would go to different churches, not everyone knew who my wife was because she came from America to live in England. So not everyone knew who she was. And I remember there was one church I went to where I, I had to drop her off and then go park the car. And as I come into the lobby, she had already been greeted by the, by the, by the greeter. I walk in the church and I'm the pastor. I work as a director in the conference and people kind of know me. And so when, they, when she saw me come in, she was like, oh, Oh, Pastor Ramden, so good to see you. Big, big, big welcome. I then walked over to my wife and kind of, you know, we're getting ready to go into the church. And as I glanced over, I could see the greeter and I could see what was going through their mind. Just ticking away. What was going through their mind, I knew exactly what was going through their mind based on what they did next. They then came back over to my wife greeted her again but this time with a more no doubt enthusiastic and, and effusive you know, greeting than they had given before a much much better greeting because now they realized they were greeting the pastor's wife gave this big greeting oh I didn't know you were married so good to see you and all the rest and then we walked into the church it was almost like their mind was thinking, oh, I, I greeted this person already, but I didn't give them a, a, a grade A greeting. I only gave them a grade C greeting, so I've got to go back and give them a better greeting. Truly being friendly, truly being loving, truly caring for people. It doesn't matter the status or, of the person that we're talking to. We genuinely want to do it just because that's who we are. You are is more powerful than I am. I am is used a lot of times in the Bible, though. You may, you, you, you may be thinking Jesus used the words I am many, many times, and he did. Jesus was very clear on his identity. Jesus, um, Jesus said many times in the Bible, he said in John chapter 9, verse 5, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, a text that almost got Jesus killed, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, effectively, effectively declaring that he was the Messiah. Jesus refers to himself by the words, the son of man, 69 or so times in the gospels. Jesus was very sure about who he was. I am before Abraham was, there was, I am, and, and so on. The gospels are full of them. I am the good shepherd. I am the light and, and so on. Jesus uses the words, I am a lot. So I'm not minimizing the words I am. I believe every one of us should know who we are and be clear on our identity as Seventh-day Adventists today and be clear as we're talking about this week about the three angels' message and how they should infuse our very being, not just our head, but also our heart. And what does that mean for the three angels' message to infuse our bodies? Jesus says, I am the vine and so on. But there was one instance in Jesus' life where instead of using the I am, he speaks differently. And I want you to turn in the Bibles, if you have one, to, to Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was in the country, um, well, today it's the country of Israel. It's located on the northern border of Israel. And there in Matthew chapter 16, he's in Philippi, Caesarea Philippi. And there in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is there. And he's with his disciples and he asked them a question in Matthew 16 and verse 13. The Bible says, Jesus says, whom... And based on the question, you know that Jesus is clear on his identity because Jesus says, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? So Jesus in his very question says, I'm the son of man. But who do men say that I am? And the answer that's given is interesting. They say, well, some say that you are the, um, some say you're the Elijah. Others say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Jeremiah. That's who people say you are. Jesus is like, okay, okay, okay. That's okay. But he looks back at his disciples and he says, but, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? He's zeroing in on them because he's saying, you're my disciples. You were with me just in the previous chapter when I, when I fed the 5,000. You were with, were with me when I walked on water. You were with me when I healed the centurion's son. You saw those things take place previously in the book of Matthew. Based on that, who do you say that I am? 
who do you say that I am? And Peter looks back at Jesus and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's who you are. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. Jesus here asks his disciples and they point back and say, you are the Christ. That's exactly who you are. Even though the Gospels are littered with the words, I am. Even though the Gospels are littered with the statements where he says, I am the son of man. On this instance, there is a power because it's the first time that his disciples look back at Jesus and say, you are. That's who you are. We've seen it. We know it. That's who you are. That's who you are. As much as we should be clear on who we are. What do our friends say about us? What do our family members say about us? What does our community say about our church? What do the people that just meet us bumping around, you know, what do they say about the small interactions they have with us? What do they say? It holds some weight and it's important for us to ponder in our minds and think. The three angels' messages, as much as it should be something that we say and know about ourselves, it should be something that other people look back at us as well and say, ah, that's who you are. You talk about the faith of Jesus and you have faith. A friend of mine in California, the name is Don McIntosh, some of you may know him. He was telling me a story about someone that, he, a friend of his that, I mean, I, I met them once or twice, but I wouldn't really say I know them. And, and they were in the last days or months of their life. And he was visiting them in hospital. The man's name was Dr. Herbert Douglas, commonly known amongst his friends as Herb. Dr. Herbert Douglas. Dr. Herbert Douglas did many, many things in his life for our church. He was one of the scholars that helped to translate the current Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. He was a president of Atlantic Union College. He was a president of Weimar Institute. He, he served the church for many years, decades, life of service, scholar. He was recognized by people who theologically agreed with him and people who didn't theologically agree with him as someone who was just a genuinely good Christian person. When my friend Don was visiting with him in the hospital soon toward at the end of his life, his, end, his life, you know, it wasn't too long to go. And he asked him a question. He said, how do you want to be remembered? You've written the Bible commentary. You've authored many books. You've been a president of institutions. You've served with various ministries. How do you want to be remembered? And he looked back and he said, I want to be remembered as a kind man. A kind man. A kind man. A few days later, he was visiting in the hospital and he was asking the nurses station, I think that they may have moved his room or something. He said, you know, where, where, where's Dr. Herb Douglas? And the nurse who barely knew this man had just been looking after him in hospital, just looked back and said, oh, he's over in that room. He's a kind man. He's a kind man. He's a kind man. His life mission, so to speak, is fulfilled. Not in the books he wrote, powerful books that he wrote, some excellent theologically sharp books he wrote. Not in the, the people he mentored, not in the institutions he led. He's over there. He's a kind man. He's a kind man. The message that he taught fervently, the message that he believed and that he preached had infused his very being so a random stranger testifying of him towards his death would say, he's a kind man. I read a story once in the book called The Insanity of God. If you've never read that book, it's a powerful book. The first half of the book deals with the, the mission experience of the author of the book. The second half of the book, he, he, he starts a ministry, so to speak, and he travels the world and interviews people who have been persecuted for their faith. And he starts to recount those stories in that book. And one of the stories he writes there was where he was over in the country of Russia. And there he was visiting with someone and he started to tell his story. Now, this man, Dimitri, he had been, he grew up and he had been uh, uh, exposed to Christianity. And when he had some children, he wanted to start to read them the Bible. 
he found himself a Bible and he starts to read to his sons the Bible. Initially, just he's reading to his sons the Bible. And then as time goes on, a few of the, the people in the village hear that he's reading the Bible to his sons, so they come as well. And then a few more come and the group goes to 10 and then 15 and 20. And eventually it goes to about 70 to 100 people are gathering in his house, hearing him read the Bible. He's not a pastor. He's not ordained. He's none of these things. He's just a Christian trying to read the Bible and do, and do what's right. The police find out and they come and they say, stop this. He doesn't stop it. He keeps doing it. They come and they arrest him. They send him to prison and the prison they sent him to was 1,000 miles away from his house. As he gets there to the prison, there's 1,500 prisoners in the prison and he's the only singular Christian. There as he's get there in the prison, he makes a decision. He's going to do two things while he's there in the prison. And every morning when he wakes up, he goes and faces the east and he raises his hands up and he sings a song of praise every single morning, the same song. And every morning when he sings that song, the other prisoners, the murderers, the rapists, the killers, and so on, they bang their cells, they try and drown out the noise, but he sings that song every single day. And the other thing that he does is whenever he finds a piece of paper, he gets the piece of paper and he writes on the piece of paper with a pencil or something that he can find, and he writes on the piece of paper all the Bible text that he knows, and he sticks that piece of paper on the pipe, wet pipe, in the corner of his room. The guards see the paper, they come in, they beat him. And this happens again and again and again and again. They try and get him to break. They tell him that his wife has given up on their marriage. They tell him that his wife has, ha, 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 has you know, given up on Christianity. He's almost going to sign and say, I, I give up on Christianity too. But the Lord reveals to him, no, 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 stand strong. He's in that prison, not just for one year, not for two years, but he's in that prison for 17 years. And towards the end of his time there, he finds this large piece of paper in the, um, in the courtyard in the prison. And he gets that piece of paper. This was soon after they really tried to get him to, 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 to buckle by telling him his wife has kind of given up on Christianity. And he gets that paper and he writes on it all the Bible texts that he can remember, all the songs he can remember. And he sticks that big, you know, letterhead, letter-sized piece of paper on the pipe in his prison. The prison guards come and they see it. And this time they beat him up really good. And they're dragging him out the cell. And they say, this time we're going to kill you. They're dragging him out the cell. And they say, dragging him, and they're dragging him out the cell to take him to the courtyard. And as they say, to kill him. Something, he says, happened. A sound started to echo out in the prison. 1,499 prisoners. All the other prisoners in the prison. They walk to the doors of their cells. They hold up their hands like they had heard, seen him do many times. And they sing word for word the song that he had sung every morning for 17 years. They raise their hands and they sing this song. Recounting the story, he says it was like a heavenly choir singing that song. They sing that song and the prison guards who had grabbed him, they, they let go and they, they look back at him. And they say, who are you? Who are you? He says, my name is Dimitri. I'm a son of the living God. Those 1,500 prisoners who had mocked him, who had made fun of him for 17 years, when his life was on the line, essentially what they said, though they never said it was, Dimitri's a Christian. You better leave him alone. He's genuine. He truly is a Christian. He had said it every day for 17 years. This is who I am. But at the moment when his life was about to be taken, 1,500 or so people came to his aid with a message that said, that man is a real Christian. The message is entitled today, you are, is more powerful you are is better than I am. As much as we should be clear about who we are, my question that I want to leave pondering with you as we close today is, what do others say about you? What do they say about you? May you be clear on who you are as a Seventh-day Adventist. May you be clear on the three angels' message and what that means to you as a person.
But today, if you want to make a commitment that your friends, that your family, that your community, that they also would testify of who you are and it would match the view you have of yourself, if that's your decision, I want you to make that commitment as we close with prayer. Let's bow our heads, Father in heaven, as we pray before you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to, to have your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the pages of scripture that testify of Jesus and his goodness to us. And the example he gives of being someone who knew who he was. But at the same time, that was echoed by those closest to him when the disciple says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. As we think on our lives, Lord, may we, may we live a life without blemish where other people, even those that don't like us, can testify that we walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.